সুপ্রিয় দর্শক সবাইকে স্বাগত জানাচ্ছি ফার্মিং ফিউচার বাংলাদেশ নিবেদিত দীপ্ত কৃষি সংলাপে পাওয়ার্ড বাই কাজী ফার্মস দীপ্ত কৃষি সংলাপের মাধ্যমে আমরা কৃষির নানাবিধ সমস্যা সমাধানের উপায় নিয়ে আলোচনা করছি প্রতি সপ্তাহে আমাদের এই সপ্তাহের আলোচনার বিষয় এগ্রিকালচারাল বায়োটেকনোলজি অ্যান্ড বায়োসেফটি ইন বাংলাদেশ প্রসপেক্টস অ্যান্ড চ্যালেঞ্জেস আমাদের সাথে এই বিশেষ আয়োজনে এই সপ্তাহের আয়োজনে যুক্ত হয়েছেন ডক্টর গ্রেগরি জেফ অ্যাসোসিয়েট ডিরেক্টর ফর পলিসি অ্যান্ড রেগুলেটরি অ্যাফেয়ার্স অ্যাট দি অ্যালায়েন্স ফর সায়েন্স দর্শক কৃষির অভূতপূর্ণ পরিবর্তন যেটা হচ্ছে তার সাথে প্রযুক্তির সমন্বয় ঘটিয়ে খাদ্য পুষ্টি নিরাপত্তা অর্জনের লক্ষ্যে বিভিন্ন দেশ কাজ করে যাচ্ছে বাংলাদেশে সেখানে সামিল হয়েছে আধুনিক কৃষি প্রযুক্তির একটি বড় কম্পোনেন্ট বা ধারা যদি আমরা বলি তাহলে হচ্ছে জীব প্রযুক্তি জীব প্রযুক্তি একটি জটিল এবং উন্নত প্রযুক্তি যা নিয়ে কাজ করার জন্য স্থানীয় এবং আন্তর্জাতিক বিভিন্ন নিয়ম নীতি রয়েছে আমরা আজকে কৃষিতে জীব প্রযুক্তির ব্যবহার এবং প্রয়োগের বিভিন্ন নীতি নিয়ে আলোচনা করব এই বিষয়ে আলোচনার জন্য আমাদের সাথে আজকে আন্তর্জাতিক একজন বিশেষজ্ঞ যুক্ত হয়েছেন আলোচনার সুবিধার্থে আমরা পুরো আলোচনাটি ইংরেজিতে করব গ্রেগ ওয়েলকাম ইউ টু দি উইকলি টিভি টক শো ফার্মিং ফিউচার বাংলাদেশ প্রেজেন্টেড দীপ্ত কৃষি সংলাপ উই উড লাইক টু নো অফ ইউ অ্যান্ড অলসো লাইক টু নো দ্যাট হোয়াট ইউ থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট বায়োসেফটি হাউ ইজলি ইট ক্যান বি ডিফাইন্ড অ্যান্ড হোয়াট আর দ্য লাইক ইমপ্লিকেশনস অফ বায়ো Uh, biosafety law and regulations uh, in regard to advancement of technology to ensure food and nutrition security. Well, thank you for having me here, Arif, and I'm uh, looking forward to our discussion today. Um, I guess let's start with the term biosafety, and really that refers to how do we uh, ensure the safety of genetically modified organisms. And I hope that your audience is familiar with that, but those are uh, crops and animals that have been uh, developed in a way to in, uh, include a new traits in them, traits that have some advantage, advantage to farmers or advantage to consumers. And so biosafety refers to analyzing those crops and animals to make sure that they're safe for the environment, for humans and for animals. Um, and that's a science-based assessment uh, of looking at potential risks and then how to manage those risks. So it's not about is something risky or not risky, but it's about how do we ensure that we minimize any potential risks and get the benefits of that technology of the product at the same time. So it's about managing risks to ensure benefits. So why we use the term risk? Is it, is it risky to uh, uh, develop any, any, any crop or any, uh, adding any trait to any animal or plant or any, any, any So product? everything we do in life has risks. We took a car here today to the studio. That has risks. You can be in an accident in that car, but we have certain safeguards. How do we manage our car risks? We have rules about how you drive. You have to have a driver's license to drive. You have um, safety features in your so car. It's, it's more of a, like managing the thing and you know, like right. how you develop it. Right, so every, everything we have, everything humans have, all we interact, has benefits to it and has risks to it. And how do we balance those and how do we manage those? And so the same thing for crops and animals. Um, you know, some crops are native to certain, species, to certain areas of the world, uh, but we bring in other crops that aren't native to the area of the world. Uh, you, know, we, for, you know, for example here, you, you might grow cotton in Bangladesh. Bang, cotton may not be natural to the ecosystem in Bangladesh and bringing that in may bring some some risks or some issues associated with it, but it also may bring benefit. It may be it, the clothing we're wearing is made of cotton. Mm -hmm. So everything has risks. So, so why do you think the, uh, the implication or importance of uh, biosafety regulation? Well, these are new technologies. And the other thing we have to remember is things that are new are novel, but they're also unusual to us. And so human nature, generally, we tend to be a little risk averse. And so things that are new, some of us, go off and adopt them, but many of us hold back. And that's especially true when we talk about things like food, because food is culture, food is, is tradition. And so we may be less uh, likely to try something new. And so anything that new, we have to make sure that there's, we have to be a little more careful about what those potential risks might be, as well as what those benefits might be. There may be a lot of benefit for something new, but there may be some risks associated with it. So these kinds of crops that are genetically engineered have uh, are novel and new and so we need to take a look at them so so uh, can you can you can you cite a few examples that the biosafety regulations act in a way that sometime uh, it played the complementary role or sometime it helped the technology to advance in a way that the community or farmer or the consumers get benefited from it 
Well, I think what the, what the, what the regulation, regulation does is it's a check. It's an independent check, a transparent check to make sure we're using the best science to develop the best products out there that we can have. And so on the one hand, it ensures that we have no uh, bad, bad outcomes by, by checking. And at the same time, it also gives us all confidence as consumers, as uh, consumers of these products, as individuals in the country, we can feel comfortable about eating those or about growing those as a farmer because we know somebody's checked to make sure that they're that they're still going to get the same yield that they got with their old crops maybe they're going to get better yield maybe there's going to have some, some added value to, to it them. yeah right so so we want that because you know each of us you know a, a farmer doesn't want to take a crop that hasn't been checked by anybody you know that's their livelihood they don't want to wake up and the crops all dead the next one morning and they have no food for their family. So they want somebody to check that out. And so the biosafety rules are one of many rules that the government uses to ensure that the products that are out there for all of us to consume and utilize are not going to have, you know, problems associated with them. So in relation to that, I mean, uh, different government and parties are involved in it. But what is the like ideal status and the practice uh, to implement a biosafety regulation and policy? Well, anytime you have any, bio, uh, uh, this, in this case, the biosafety regulation and policy, but any, I think the most important thing is transparency. So you need to know the who, what, where, when, and how uh, around the regulatory system. So who's going to do it? What ministry? What are they going to ask for? What information are they going to ask for? Which products are going to be covered by that? And then how the assessment's going to be done and how a decision's going to be made and how that decision's going to be communicated to the relevant stakeholders. So what the regulatory system does is explain all of that. It tells the developer, here are the steps you need to bring a product to market. Here's who you have to interact with. And it tells everybody else who- so to, to comply with. with both like local uh, uh, requirement or, and regional or international requirements. So in some cases there are international requirements. So here, uh, you know, uh, there are international treaties around the movement of genetically modified organisms to make sure that they don't have adverse impacts on the environment. And the Bangladesh is a member of those treaties. And so those require, those have certain obligations, certain uh, legal requirements. And so the laws in Bangladesh implement those international treaties, which are mm -hmm. harmonization. They allow everybody in all the different countries in the world to trade among each other, to ensure that they're not harming their environment and to get the benefits of new technologies. So uh, I have a simple question that for a researcher or someone who is doing the science in the laboratory, uh, on the field, on the ground, is it required for them to, uh, to have the uh, extensive knowledge about biosafety policy and regulation? Uh, how, how do you evaluate that? Well, you know, if you're a scientist developing products, um, you first want to have your scientific knowledge about your area of field and things like that. But, but even in a laboratory, there are, are government requirements. And so all of us have government requirements that are imposed upon us every day. And we need to know what those are. So if you are working on a genetically modified crop in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. you should have some knowledge about what are the laws and requirements that might affect the product that you're developing, the research that you're doing, even at the research stage. So uh, uh, you have traveled many parts of the world. You have seen many and you have been in this process for a long time. Uh, how you see and evaluate uh, our position uh, uh, in relation to biosafety regulation in Bangladesh, particularly where we are now, what are the areas we need to uh, improve, where, uh, where we can invest? So, um, you know, Bangladesh has had a biosafety policy for a long time, for many, many years. And in fact, they were one of the first Asian countries to have to establish a biosafety policy and regulations to go along with that. And so that made them a leader in the area. And that's one of the reasons they have farmers who grow BT eggplant in this country is because they put that policy in place. Mm -hmm. They put those regulations in place. So, you know, they've been, they started out being one of the leaders uh, in the area, in this field. I think that, you know, they still have a ways to go. They have lots of good rules and regulations on paper but sometimes they're not implemented in as efficient and transparent a way as we might like. We really, what I see in many, many countries and what the ideal would be is a science-based regulatory system that is both transparent and efficient. So if somebody comes with them with a product that they can look at it, 
and make a science-based decision about whether it's safe and get that to the developer uh, in a short period of time so that uh, that product can get to market and the country can utilize those benefits. And I think you know what I've seen and heard about in Bangladesh is they have some of that, but it's not as efficient as it might be. They may need some additional capacity in their regulatory agencies to really be able to do that in a timely manner. So, you know, and I it's, think they're it's, similar. It's, it's, it's relatively new, you know, for, for a country like Bangladesh, though uh, it's been in the industry for more than 25 years. But uh, from our understanding, we got the first genetically engineered crop in 2013. So, I mean, uh, I think there is a, 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 a way to, to learn more and uh, build our capacity on that. What do you think? Right. No, I mean, the, the, the science, it takes a while to do these crops. There aren't that many of them throughout the world. And so you're right. In order to build the capacity in the regulatory system, in the government, you also have to have applications and applications have to move forward. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, both of them have to happen hand in hand. So, uh, I mean, what is the relationship of individual, you know, like capacity and then institutional capacity in this, in this periphery or in this portfolio of uh, learning uh, biosafety policy and regulation and implementing them in the field of research? So, I mean, you have to have both institutional capacity and individual capacity. You have to have institutions who have knowledge about these areas, know what to do, and have staff that can do that, but you also have to have individuals, uh, individuals who both have scientific expertise in order to do good biosafety oversight. You may need somebody who you know, understands plant biology, for example, if we're looking at crops, mm -hmm. if we're looking at a, a crop like eggplant or a crop like corn or a crop like cotton, you need to have people who understand the biology of those crops and also understand the agricultural systems that they're growing in. Um, so you need both individuals and you need the institutions both of them have to have that capacity. And that takes a while to develop. Um, and this field is still growing. I mean, what was a biosafety risk assessment 20 years ago is less sophisticated than what we are today. Because even though Bangladesh hasn't had a lot of these crops, there have been a lot of these crops in the country where I come from, the United States, or other places around the world. And so as we've had more crops come to market, uh, countries have gotten better at analyzing what are the potential risks and what are the potential benefits and how to balance those. And other countries who haven't had as many have to catch up and build that same capacity. Yeah, uh, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that dynamic, there are new avenues, for example, gene editing. Uh, and probably in near term future, we'll see a more advanced technology. So wh what are the rooms of advancement and learning opportunity and how actually policy regulations are defining these new uh, avenue, new direction uh, of the technology and improvement. Well, you're so right, Arif. I mean, five years ago, we didn't know about, we, we barely knew about CRISPR, and now people are producing products using CRISPR, gene editing crops. And five years from now, there'll probably be four or five new different ways of editing the genomes of crops and animals to mm -hmm. improve those varieties that you and I don't even know about. And so, um, we want to utilize those technologies, and with those technologies, um, may, they may be even safer than the older technologies. Um, in many cases, that's the, that's, the, that's the fact. So what I think is always most important in a policy and in the government is flexibility. You want flexibility to be able to change with the times. As things change, you want to be able to change also. If something is less risky, you may need to do less oversight of it. And if there's something that's really, really beneficial, you may want to streamline that. And so, so I think you bring up a good point. And so we have this balancing where we want regulatory systems to, mm -hmm. to be thorough. We want them to be transparent. We want them to be efficient, but we also need them to be flexible so that, that, that uh, as new things come about, they can adapt and do that. And I think you know, Bangladesh hasn't had any adaptation of their regulatory system yet for gene editing. But some of your neighbors have started doing that. The Philippines, for example, recently came out with some guidelines and some uh, modifications to their regulatory system that now treats gene editing slightly differently or some applications of it differently than we might call a classic GMO. So it's a learning process and a process willingness to, to change things as, as the technology evolves. So why, why do you think that this technology is actually leading and directing us towards, uh, you know, like tackling um, um, a challenge of the food and nutrition security, climate change, or increased population who requires more food, 
uh, mitigating you know like the impact of agriculture in environmental risk factors. So you know feeding humans takes takes a lot of effort and we all have to thank the farmers who are out there doing that but farming is not easy and as you know it's always subject to weather it's subject to so many different conditions soil conditions water conditions and so you know scientists have been working for as long as humans have been on this earth you know people have been developing crops to, to try to improve yield and provide nutrition to consumers uh, who are eating those humans who are eating those mm -hmm. but but there's always new challenges new pests droughts salinity all kinds of things and so we need uh, all kinds of tools to try to address those. And biotechnology, genetic engineering, gene editing, uh, GMOs, is one technology that can help solve those problems. So there are applications of this technology that will increase yields of farmers. I mean, so, would, you, would you mind share a few examples? Like, we, we, we know about BT egg plant in Bangladesh, but is there any other crop uh, in any other country uh, that has been, uh, you know, like, deregulated? Uh, farmers are getting benefit from that? Yes, I mean, one of your neighbors, the Philippines, has been growing um, maize for a long time. Their farmers have been growing maize and getting benefits from that. I believe that same crop is also grown in Vietnam these days. So um, there are, no, you know, and there's a, a genetically engineered cotton that's being grown in India uh, by many, many millions of farmers there getting benefits from that. And then in my country, we have, I think, you know, 10 or 11 different crops that are genetically engineered. Some of them are large commodity crops like corn and soybeans and cotton, but we also have consumer friendly crops. So uh, green and yellow squashes that are genetically engineered, uh, pineapples that are pink, that have been genetically engineered that are pink instead of looking yeah. yellow. Papaya. Papaya, you know, apples. Uh, and so, so there are a number of, you know, there are you know, I can't tell you how many countries, but there are several dozen countries around the world that are, have farmers who are growing genetically engineered crops. And they do that because they have some benefit, some additional trait in them that wouldn't otherwise be in them. Whether that increases yield, whether that reduces the amount of pesticides they use, whether that allows them to have climate change, climate friendly uh, practices right. such as no-till to protect the soil and protect groundwater mm -hmm. from getting contaminated. They're all different kinds of traits that are involved with them. So, so like the technology is advancing, agriculture itself is changing. Uh, and why do you invest on these regulations? Are they are friendly and helping uh, uh, to, to proceed with the technological advancement or they are constraining the uh, technological advancement? You know, I think peop different people would say have different answers to that. I think that they do both at the same time. I do think they you need some sort of oversight here. You do need to check on some of these products before they go to market. I think without that, you would have potential market issues, trade issues, uh, consumer issues. So you need that. And you also want to ensure that they aren't going to harm the environment or harm humans or animals. So I think you need some oversight. At the same time, sometimes that oversight can, in some countries, be constraining. It can be take too long. It's not done in a way that's science-based. And so uh, it can hurt, uh, delay the development or the, the commercialization of some of these crops. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for coming uh, and meeting us and having this uh, important, very important discussion. Darshak, I'm going to talk about the crisis of the project in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, the crisis of the project is the crisis of the project in the gene precursor, gene editing project. এবং সেই প্রযুক্তিগুলো নিয়ে কাজ করার জন্য স্থানীয় আন্তর্জাতিক বিভিন্ন নিয়ম নীতি মেনে আসলে কাজ করতে হয় আমরা আজকে কৃষি জীব প্রযুক্তির নিয়ম প্রসঙ্গে এবং সেগুলো মেনে চলার যে গুরুত্ব আছে সেগুলো নিয়ে আলোচনা করলাম আমাদের গুরুত্বপূর্ণ আলোচনায় যুক্ত হয়েছিলেন গ্রেগ জেফি উনি অ্যাসোসিয়েট ডিরেক্টর হিসেবে কাজ করছেন পলিসি অ্যান্ড রেগুলেটেড অ্যাফেয়ার্স অ্যাট অ্যালায়েন্স ফর সায়েন্স পুরো আলোচনায় আমি আরিফ ছিলাম আপনাদের সাথে আমাদের এই নিয়মিত আলোচনা প্রচারিত হচ্ছে প্রতি শুক্রবার বিকেল পাঁচটা তিরিশ মিনিটে ফার্মিং ফিচার বাংলাদেশ নিবেদিত দীপ্ত কৃষি সংলাপের পরবর্তী পর্ব দেখার আমন্ত্রণ জানিয়ে বিদায় নিচ্ছি সবাই ভালো থাকবেন নিরাপদে থাকবেন